degree and um, I'm a landscape architect with a specialized specialization in natural habitat restoration. And um, I really thank you for joining us. This um, workshop is subtitled Gardening as if, as if Life Depends on It. And um, that refers to the importance of protecting not only human life, as you would expect with this firewise landscaping, but um, protecting the life of the wildlife and its habitat that um, also inhabits this landscape. And um, I'm a board member of the Sonoma Ecology Center. And after the 2017 fires, we noticed that um, a few landscapes were being cleared within 100 feet of people's homes, and that's the defensible space zone. So um, we were concerned and realized that people needed some education. And on the other hand, a lot of people were actually doing nothing because they were a little bit confused about what would be the best thing to do to protect themselves and their property. So um, we formed, oh, and by the way, let me put out some thanks to the Glen Ellen Forum. Some of you may be wondering why the Glen Ellen Forum and, and where Oz came from. Um, this workshop was originally going to be put on by the folks at the Glen Ellen Forum. We were gonna have it at the community church back in late March. And of course that was, um, held up and we postponed it, but everyone at the Glen Ellen, Glen Ellen Forum has been super supportive. We've been talking about this for eight months and um, everyone has been very patient. So I wanna thank not only Oz, but Nick Brown and Melissa Dowling, Shannon Lee and the Landscape and Environment Committee, all of whom have been incredibly enthusiastic in encouraging this to happen. Um, we also did a workshop up on Bennett Ridge back in December. Um, 70 out of 90 homes were burned to the ground there. And I have a friend who asked, who asked me if the Ecology Center could put on a workshop to help um, people revegetate their landscapes. So we formed this group called the Resilient Landscapes Coalition. And it's um, made up of the Habitat Corridor Project. You'll be hearing today from April Owens who is the executive director of the Habitat Carter Project. She's also the chair of the horticulture program of the Milo Baker chapter of the Native Plant Society. Um, she's uh, trained as the landscape architect. And um, I'll tell you a little bit about her when we come to the agenda. Um, we also, myself from the Sonoma Ecology Center, uh, also on the team is Caitlin Cornwall and Jason Mills. Uh, who is the restoration program manager at the Ecology Center. And then April Owens from UC, the UC Master Gardener program. She's the head of the program. And um, Cleo Tarazi, who is her right-hand person. So that's the, the main team. And we've also done this in partnership with um, Roberta McIntyre of FireSafe Sonoma and um, the County of Sonoma Fire Prevention Division, uh, Carolyn Safford and Chief James Williams. And um, it's been an honor, an absolute honor to work with the fire agency people. We've spent countless hours preparing for this workshop and going over the material. And um, as you can imagine, we have different perspectives. Um, an ecologist might look at a group of shrubs with a tree overhead and think habitat, shelter, food, whereas a firefighter might look at it and see a potential burning bush with possible ladder fuels and um, a crown fire. So it's important to see both. And um, that's what we're trying to, that's what we're planning to bring to you today, the uh, both perspectives. So the agenda, um, I'll be speaking about the ecological perspective and I'll touch on regulations then Mimi Enright from uh, UC Master Gardeners of Sonoma will be talking about basic design and maintenance principles, um, also plant selection, sustainability, and neighborhood considerations. And then April from the Habitat Corridor Project will be going more deeply into landscape design and um, planting examples. 
So the goal here is to create defensible space in the 100 foot zone of the home, which is both beautiful, wildlife friendly and sustainable. And this is a, a picture of a native plant and we will be emphasizing the use of native species. This is uh, coral bells and it is um, incredibly popular with bees and birds and it's there in the understory of a lovely oak woodland. So this, this gives you both, right? The um, defensible space and the, the beauty and the wildlife habitat. So it's the landowner's responsibility to be aware of regulations. And um, while it, it can be a little complicated and um, maybe in the questions and answers, if um, Care Leone is, is on, we can talk a little bit about this, but landowners are responsible to be familiar with the state public resources code 4291, as well as the county ordinance 6148 chapter 13A. And, um, if people like, we could put in the chat box um, the URLs where you can find that information. Um, also, if you live along the creek, uh, it's, you need to be familiar with the rules and regulations from local, state, and federal agencies. And I would direct you to the County Permit and Resources Department to get that information. So um, to give sort of an overview of fire in our landscape, um, with increasingly dry summers and severe wind events, and with people moving into the fire prone areas, uh, there's much more likelihood of uh, significant damage to life and property. The slide here shows the 1964 Hanley fire on the left and the pink, um, I think I have, uh, pointer actually I can't find it right now but the pink outline shows the path of the fire in 64 and then the 2017 Tubbs fire to orient you the um, the dark red is developed areas so the the line on the left is the uh, um, highly high density urban development and it's the 101 corridor and then the tan or yellow is um, low density urban development. And you can see the change between 1964 and 2017. And within the path of the fire, you can see how much devastation there was to homes. So now that we've moved into the fire zone and basically the wildland urban interface, it's really our responsibility to take care of ourselves, our property, and our neighbors. Um, some would say it's not such a good idea to be in the fire zone, but Frankly, since we're there, we have a job to do. So working together as a community, we can, we can be much more effective in protecting our property. So now we get to the fun part, at least the fun part for me, um, taking care of all our neighbors. So in this picture, the, the butterfly is called a painted lady, and that's a Buick's wren and of course a squirrel. And um, they're in their native habitat. And I imagine that most of you like me moved to this area because it's so beautiful and because of the wonderful wildlife. Um, but as you saw in that past slide, we've moved into the habitat of a good deal of wildlife. And so now it's our job to take care of it. We have a, we have a really important role since we've displaced them. And um, Doug Tallamy, who wrote the book called Bringing Nature Home, uh, has the idea of making our gardens into islands of habitat. He opens Bringing Nature Home with a statement, for the first time in history, gardeners become important players in the management of our nation's wildlife. So um, we have that important role. And besides protecting wildlife, we can support ecosystem services um, providing habitat for pollinators, sequestering carbon, cleaning and managing water, slow it, sink it, spread it, and store it, and enriching the soil and holding it in place. So I want to talk a little bit about, about biodiversity, which is defined as the web of life above and below ground, which includes plants, animals, fungi, and microorganisms. Um, 
In 2017, a large German study reported a decline of more than 75% of insect biomass across 63 nature preserves. And studies like that have been, um, have been found to be true in other areas, a study in Puerto Rico, other studies in Australia, and many of us are familiar with the continuing drop in monarch butterflies as an example. Um, there's a, we have only about 3% of the numbers that were found in 1980. So it's a significant issue and um, insects are truly the foundation of many life systems. Um, they of course pollinate much of our food and I don't think, I would probably preach into the choir in this group, but, um, but it's, it's an important reason for us to be landscaping with wildlife in mind. Um, a lot of the reasons for this degradation is habitat loss from development, um, climate change, the use of pesticides in agriculture, but also in um, residential homes. And um, interestingly, light pollution. It's something new that I've been learning about. <clears throat> but our gardens can make a difference. So we want to support biodiversity. And one of the most important things to do is planting native plants. And we would recommend 70 to 80% of your landscapes being um, native plants. And not just California natives, but natives that um, are local to our area, like you know, even Sonoma County, or, or possibly even your um, immediately surrounding ecosystem, although that's much harder to do. But um, native plants improve biodiversity by providing food for insects and birds and other animals that have evolved with those plants over millennia. And it's surprising but true that um, species do spe specialize on plants. And an example is the pipevine swallowtail butterfly, which is there in the lower right corner. Um, pipe vines are actually found all, pipe vine swallowtails are found all across the country. And I learned yesterday, actually, in California, we have a small pocket of them just in the North Bay. And they actually lay their eggs on the pipe vine. It's the only place they lay their eggs, and it's the only plant that the caterpillars will eat. So if there weren't any pipe vine around, there would be no pipe vine swallowtails. So the more we actually plant specific plants that will nurture and feed the wildlife we wanna promote, the, the more we'll be able to support biodiversity. Um, I also wanna mention the importance of massing plants for wildlife food and shelter. The more plants you have of a single species that provides food or, um, well, nectar in particular, uh, the more likely a, an animal will want to come to that location because there'll be plenty to eat. Um, use integrated pest management and provide a water source. So those are some of the basics for supporting biodiversity. And um, we couldn't do this slideshow without having the charismatic megafauna of our state bird. Um, the quail actually nests on the ground. So um, that's, that's why it's important to have cover. And you know, one of the messages that we want to bring in creating defensible space is that you don't want to have a moonscape and you don't even want to have all mulch with a, a checkerboard of a few plants here or there, but it's important to have shelter so that the wildlife can get away from predators, among other things. So a few words about plant communities. Um, in Sonoma Valley, there are a number of plant communities. There are others outside of the valley, but we were focusing this on Glen Ellen in particular. So. There's the oak woodland, which, um, and a plant community is a unique association of plants that share the same habitat needs. So they have dominant species, like in an oak woodland, the dominant species is the, the oak. Um, valley oak would be found along in the valley bottoms, and in the lower to middle slopes, you'll find blue oaks and coast live oaks, and then their associated understory. And then in the riparian forest, which grows along streams, um, 50, within 20 to even 300 feet or more, depending on the landscape surrounding it, 
Um, and then there's the redwood forest, which in Sonoma Valley tends to grow on the west side, which is um, eastern facing and tends to be cooler and more shaded. And, um, and then the chaparral, which in Sonoma Valley grows on the east side um, with western facing slopes um, because they're much hotter. And that's a shrub dominated um, habitat plant community. Um, so it's important to actually be aware of the plant community that you live in so that you'll choose the plants that will thrive in those environments. So just to say a few more words about oak woodlands and hear those coral bells again, they can come in different colors. And um, it's a beautiful understory here. Um, oaks are, they support many of our favorite garden birds, such as quail, bluebirds, robins, orioles, and acorn woodpeckers. And oaks produce the most insects, including caterpillars, of any other plant species. And oak woodlands are the most productive of many other, of, of any other plant community, in fact. An oak can actually host 270 different caterpillars, species, not just caterpillars. They can have thousands and thousands of caterpillars. And birds actually feed their young caterpillars in bulk that uh, caterpillars produce the highest nutrients per package. So um, it's, it really is important to take care of our oaks and our oak woodlands. And to do that, we have to also take care of the root system, which is the drip line and sometimes beyond. Um, and one of the ways to do that is to keep the leaf litter or at least some portion of the leaf litter in place. And when you're dealing with defensible space, you wanna clean up the leaf litter mostly, at least within 30 feet of the home. And um, I've had people laugh at me for saying, well, during fire season, you could actually just rake up the leaf litter and bag it and then sprinkle it back down after fire season is over. So, you know, to each his own, I, I would actually do that. Um, so you wanna actually protect the roots of the oak trees to make the oak tree healthy so that it can actually handle all those insects and caterpillars that are colonizing it and eating its leaves and doing things besides feeding the birds. So one of the benefits of um, taking care of our plants, and um, I, I forgot to mention that biodiversity is the web of life above ground and below ground. And the purpose of this slide is to show how vegetation sequesters carbon. And in order to do that, it has to have a really robust set of microorganisms and a really robust biodiversity underground. So um, soils actually hold more carbon than the atmosphere or the plant and animal life combined. So um, you have to have plant, healthy plant roots for the plants to take in the CO2 and photosynthesize it into um, food for producing more leaves and more roots. And climate experts say that no strategy to reduce climate change is complete without using the vast carbon sinks available. So that's something that we can do in our gardens. Um, so keeping vegetation on the hill slopes keeps the soil in place, um, vegetation and mulch, which keeps the creeks clean and provides habitat for fish. Um, I wanna say a little bit about maintenance for habitat values. Um, and April and Mimi will talk about this too. But timing is everything. Um, birds are nesting from March all the way through August. So the best time to do maintenance if you're gonna do any substantial clearing is from September through February. Um, in this picture, the young lady there is removing uh, non-native invasive broom plants. And, um, that's providing the understory. They're very, very fire prone. And then I've, I've put back this picture of the oak woodland, which has been revegetated with um, the heuchera and um, another, some other ground cover in there. And you know how I mentioned that it's important for us to both see habitat and see the fire issues. And interestingly, I looked at this picture last night and 
I realized that there is potential um, and likely fuel ladders in this picture in the background. So the foreground is what we're going for with, you wanna have vertical spacing between the lower vegetation and the tree branches. And um, others will be talking about that later. So here's a picture of an Oregon junco. Um, these birds nest on the ground and they are nesting from March through August. So if you're out there doing any maintenance in your yard during breeding season, just keep your eye out for little nests with eggs. Um, they won't only be juncos, there are any number of birds that actually nest on the ground or in low shrubs. So we want to avoid over clearing and with everything I've said, you can imagine that um, that this particular hill slope has virtually no habitat value. It's going to cause significant erosion and it is um, highly susceptible to invasive fire prone weeds. And here again is um, the uh, French broom in full flower. Uh, each one of these plants can produce uh, over a thousand seeds and they like to project them for several feet. So um, broom can actually spread very, very quickly and it is highly ignitable. Another highly ignitable non-native plant is um, this oat grass. It's an annual grass and it will take over if you, you overclear. So um, circling back to um, the, the reasons for the declines in biodiversity, one of the reasons that I've been learning about recently is light pollution. And remembering what I said about the importance of oaks for providing food for wildlife, it would be really, really hard for any kind of insect, caterpillar, or even a bird to make use of this tree. Um, so while the structure might be lightly, light, lovely and we may want to highlight it, um, it's not exactly a good idea. Maybe if you turn it on for, I don't know, 15 minutes in the evening, but um, so while insects haven't really been adequately studied, what we believe is that half of them are nocturnal and they're unable to locate food or mates when there's significant artificial lighting. Um, insects that are active during the day may also be disturbed by light at night when they're trying to rest. So um, turning off the lights or setting them on a timer so that they're not taking over is a good idea. And the inset there is a firefly. It's our native firefly. The female doesn't actually fly, the male does. But um, they, they find each other by the light they emit. So in closing, I just wanna say, we encourage you to become more intimate with your garden and your wildlife neighbors. And while reducing the risk Fire with enhancing biodiversity. It's definitely worth the time and effort. And um, with that, we can, I think we were planning on um, having some, a few questions before the next speaker. Um, hi, Ellie, this is Cleo. I don't see any questions uh, in the chat box. Okay, great. Can you hear me? Um, but I did give the links to the state and the county, uh, the, the, the regulations, and also a link that just came in as you were talking from Fire Safe Sonoma on a webinar on structural uh, hardening webinar. Okay, that's great. Um, oh, wait, will this presentation be available later? Yes, we will have it on video later. We will yeah. post it. So I want to introduce Mimi Enright, who's the program manager for the UC Master Gardeners. I want to say gardeners, but it's the gardener program of Sonoma County. <laughs> and um, she's terrific. We've been working together for about eight months. And she's going to be talking about design principles, design and maintenance principles. And um, take it away, Mimi. Great. Thank you, Ellie. Um... Hold on, everybody, while we make our transition over. Mimi, I just wanted to let you know we have about 114 guests. Fantastic. Okay. All right. 
Um, so hopefully everybody's seeing my main slide, my cover slide. Cleo, can you confirm that uh, you're not seeing my speaker's notes? No, I'm, we're seeing your speaker notes. Oh, you are seeing my speaker's notes. Yes. Uh, hold on. Right. Sorry, you guys. We are we are in new a new world. <laughs> uh, okay. And again, can you see just my main entry slide and not my speaker? Yes. Slide? Now we see your main entry slide, maybe. Let's hope. Wonderful. The Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Yes, very grateful for that. And um, uh, wow, over 100 people in the session today. I'm so thrilled to have all of you um, here uh, with us, joining us today. Um, so thank you, Ellie, for your eloquent uh, introduction um, to the topics um, that we're covering today. And um, I'm hoping most of you are familiar, I hope, with who the UC Master Gardener program is and what we do. Uh, we're actually trained agents of the University of California, and our mission is to extend the educational outreach of UC to our community. And we do that with a focus on sustainable landscape principles as our core message. And um, after the 2017 wildfires, uh, our Master Gardener program spent a year doing a deep dive into all the content that is out there on defensible space. Um, our goal was to synthesize and simplify that content for our community. Uh, and we actually consider this presentation you're seeing today as version 2.0 of our Firewise Educational Outreach uh, with uh, more specific recommendations for the different zones of dis defensible space around your home. Um, and we are, as Ellie said, we're really proud of the partnership that we've developed with the Sonoma Ecology Center and Habitat Corridor Project on this work. And I also want to extend a big thank you to um, Carolyn Safford and Chief Williams from the County of Sonoma Office of Fire and Emergency Services um, for their work with us over the last year, their patient work with us over the last year, um, as we uh, talked through some of the tensions that exist um, between developing a firewise landscape um, and also having it be a sustainable landscape along the principles that Ellie was talking about. And I think we've both learned a lot from each other over the last year. Um, and a big shout out and thank you to Fire Safe Sonoma for their support um, uh, throughout our initiative as well. So our goal was really to, to marry these um, sustainable landscape principles with firewise landscaping. And um, as Ellie so eloquently shared, our climate is changing and so are our landscapes. Um, I think we're all um, intimately familiar with those issues and challenges, particularly here in Sonoma County. But each property can and should make a difference in supporting biodiversity and being prepared for future fires. So we're hoping to provide some clarity and simplicity to the volume of existing information on this topic. This is not meant as prescriptive mandates, but as guidelines for individual homeowners for decision making on their own properties. And each of us needs to make decisions to be better prepared as we move ahead. Okay. All right, uh, we have a lot of territory to cover in a short amount of time. And I'm gonna try to keep my, I tend to talk really fast. And I've got a lot of content to cover in 45 minutes. Um, so I'm gonna do my best to try to keep my pace slow, but, but cover the, um, the large amount of material that I wanna share with you this morning. So here's the agenda of what I'm gonna be covering in my presentation. I uh, do a, just a quick touch on fire basics and um, mostly for um, how it informs the decisions we're making in the defensible space. And then move into um, plant selection considerations and designing for fire. Then a discussion of how to design your home landscape with fire in mind based on the different zones in the zero to 100 foot zone around your home. And then a quick touch on mulch. Um, and then ongoing maintenance, which is one of the most important aspects of continuing to keep our properties as ready as we can before the next fire. So let's, let's dive on in. Um, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on fire and how it operates. Um, our firefighting personnel um, can do a much better job at that than I can. Uh, our expertise is really more about uh, your home landscape. Um, but I want to cover a few basics which are important to the context of our conversation today. So fire must have three elements in order to burn. 
fuel, oxygen, and heat. And what we can try to do to manage the fuel aspect of the fire, if the fire triangle, I'm sorry, what we can do to help manage um, fires on our home landscapes is in the fuel aspect of the fire triangle, right? We have no uh, influence over uh, oxygen or heat. We have no influence over the winds that drive the fire behavior, but what we can control is the fuel. And very basically, fuel is anything that will burn, right? So this includes vegetation, such as trees, woody shrubs, and perennials in our landscapes, landscape mulch, fencing, roofing, decks, lawn furniture, arbors, trellises, planter boxes, right? We, we need to look at all these things with a different lens that they can actually be fuel in a fire. So there are three threats or exposures that a building can experience during a wildfire. Either direct flame or radiant heat or embers. And as we all unfortunately are so familiar with now here in Sonoma County, embers under wildfire conditions can be persistent and very unpredictable. Embers have a way of finding a weakness in a home and most building ignitions have been attributed to embers. They can ignite building components and contents directly or ignite vegetation or other combustible items adjacent to or near a building. This then can result in a radiant heat and or direct flame contact exposure. For example, embers may land on an ignite debris that has accumulated in your gutter and the burning debris then causes direct flame contact on the edge of the roof or embers can ignite nearby vegetation and that could result in a radiant heat exposure to the side of a building, potentially igniting combustible siding or breaking the glass in a window. And then the opening from the broken glass then would allow embers to enter the building and ignite combustible materials such as carpeting or furniture. Okay. So today we are focusing on the fuels <clears throat> in the 100 foot zone surrounding your home. And the concept of the home ignition zone or defensible space was actually developed by USDA Forest Service fire scientist Jack Cohan in the late 1990s, following some breakthrough experimental research into how homes ignite due to the effects of radiant heat. And since then, wildfire recommendations have been shaped by this fire science, and because of it, we are able to provide actionable guidance for homeowners to help them prepare their homes or landscapes to resist wildfire. So it's important to consider what your goals are in preparing for the next fire. Certainly, we want to slow the fire and reduce the possibility of it catching your house on fire. But it's also important to ensure that there is an exit plan for you and your family. And it's just as important to ensure that there is appropriate access for firefighters coming to defend your home for their safety. So I assume that most of you on this webinar with us today have been through at least the Kincaid fire, if not the Kincaid fire and the 2017 fire. I didn't know you were right. And here's the bottom line. Uh, uh oh, I'm <laughs> having like we have I've a little, lost, an audio problem. Cleo, I hope you'll help with that. I'm having an audio problem. Yeah, I've lost. I can see you, but I can't see the screen you want us to see. Okay, Cleo, can you see my screen? I'll just leave a bag with um and get in is you can keep it. It's a nice little bento type box and it's got the directions on the lid. So. Okay, Cleo, can you help with some okay. muting for me? So thank you. <laughs> thank you. All right. Okay, hold on, you guys. I'm going to take a moment and make sure everybody's muted. So uh, part of those uh, important logistics uh, that Oz was kind enough to share with us at the beginning of the call to, to make sure you're muted. Um, so anyways, uh, so here's the bottom line. Um, what you do to prepare your home and landscape for the next fire matters. We know what the truths are in this slide and in this presentation based on our um, very painful experience, especially here in Sonoma County. And your actions are key to prepare for the next wildfire. We all know how hard our firefighters have worked to protect our homes and communities. And given the scopes of the wildfires we have seen, we know that we can't assume that there will be a shiny red truck parked outside of your home when the fire comes. So attending this workshop is a great first step, 
but coming to a meeting isn't enough. You need to take action, even little steps. And we hope that you will take at least a few tips away from this meeting and get started so we are all a little better prepared and our homes, family, community, and firefighters are perhaps a little more safe. Okay, so the, one of the mantras uh, in the firefighting world is your starting point is your home, right? Start at your house and then work out into the landscape. So we are not going into the topic of home hardening today as our focus as Master Gardeners is on the landscape. Um, there are many wonderful resources um, that are available to help guide you through the home hardening process. So I'll share a few of those at the end of my presentation. I know Cleo in, uh, shared in the chat box a link to a home hardening webinar that uh, FireSafe Sonoma is hosting um, on Monday. So highly recommend that you participate that in, in that webinar um, because the most important step you can take is starting on hardening your home. But here are the different defensible space zones in your home landscape that we're gonna be talking about today. So after you've hardened your home, you wanna move out and look at your zero to five foot zone around your house perimeter. Then you move out from uh, the zone of five to 30 feet from your home, and then from there to 30 to 100 feet. So here are a few of our basic firewise landscaping principles. And resilient garden design is really about plant selection and plant placement, maintenance, maintenance, maintenance. Um, our mantra is Master Gardeners has historically been compost, 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 and mulch, mulch, mulch. But from a firewise landscaping perspective, it's maintenance, maintenance, maintenance. It's all important. Uh, and we hope that all of this is done with a lens of sustainability about retaining water on your property, conserving water and energy, supporting wildlife, and sequestering carbon. So there isn't scientific research that supports all of our recommendations. This is still a growing area of research. But I will point out through the presentation where recommendations are supported by scientific research. And as we go through today's presentation, any items you see highlighted in red represent Sonoma County code requirements. Okay, so let's get started with some basic concepts for creating a firewise landscape. We recommend choosing fire resistant landscape features such as inorganic mulch, such as gravel or decomposed granite, permeable pavement, stone walls, ponds, dry creek beds, or boulders. You need to carefully and select and place plants with spacing to disrupt a fire. And as I mentioned before, ongoing maintenance is critical to keep your landscape healthy and prepared for the next fire. Throughout the year, you need to remove any dead or dying shrubs, trees, or branches. So as I mentioned uh, just a slide ago, I've got it highlighted in red. That means that this is a county throughout the year, remove any dead, dying shrubs, trees, or branches. This is a key component of creating a firewise landscape. You wanna avoid planting close to structures as embers landing in those plants can transmit fire to your home. And you wanna prune tree limbs, all tree limbs six feet up from the ground or one third the height of a smaller tree. For example, if a tree is 12 feet high, limit up four feet from the ground and then continue to maintain it as it grows. And again, this, this last item is, is, is in red, highlighting that it's a county code requirement. You wanna make it easy for firefighters to find you. If you have multiple driveways off one access road, place a sign at the beginning of the road with all the numbers, then place a sign at each driveway and on your house. And reflective street and address signs are also a county code requirement. So there's a very compelling video from the Kincaid fire where firefighters are trying to hold off the fire from moving into the town of Windsor. And the video clip shows wood fences burning and moving the fire to the home. It's very important to re replace any wood fence or gate that attaches to your home. And these are showing some great alternatives in uh, non-organic materials and metal uh, that can uh, provide you screening or protection protection while continuing to help preserve your views. Okay, let's dive into plant selection considerations. So plant selection should no longer be about 
oh, this flower is pretty. And I know how hard that is when you walk into the nursery and there's all those temptations, but there are much broader considerations from a fire and ecology perspective that we should be taking into account. A poorly planted plant is stressed and requires more water nutrients and is more susceptible to predation, drought, and fire. Right plant in the right place is very important in firewise landscaping. So we wanna choose plants that will grow to a size appropriate for their location. So when you pick up that small little four inch pot with a plant in the nursery, you need to pay attention to what its mature size will be and where you are planning to put it in your landscape. And we wanna locate plants where excess pruning is not required to maintain desired spacing. So we need to consider not only how large this plant will grow, but will it thrive where it will be planted, right? So this affects the health and vigor and flammability of a plant. If it's a plant that prefers shade, are you putting it in full sun? And then are you up for the maintenance uh, that the plant will require? Is it invasive? Ellie did, had a great graphic showing removal of uh, French broom, which is highly invasive for us here in Sonoma County. Will it spread to a neighbor's property and create a fire threat? And we also need to consider how a plant changes, can change over its lifespan. Lavender is a great example that so many of us are familiar with. It starts out herbaceous and becomes more woody over time, and that will affect its fuel load. Um, so after being deeply enmeshed in this topic, I've really started to see my landscape through a different lens. I think about how fire will move through the landscape around my home and how much fuel that would add to a fire. How much woody mass is there? With this lens last winter, I cut back some larger salvias in my landscape that had become very woody. And they've grown back beautifully this spring with more herbaceous stems and less you, and I will have to cut them back again. But if you don't want to do this kind of maintenance, this kind of regular maintenance, then plant selection for how a plant will change over time is a very important consideration. So some of you may have come to the session today hoping for a list of fire resistant plants for your garden. Uh, in the scientific community, there is a lack of consensus on the elements to test to confirm plant flammability. Given this, the University of California does not advocate the use of fire resistant plant lists. Applied to plants, the term fire resistant may be misleading. All plants will burn under the right conditions. And this picture shows some succulents that burned during the Tubbs fire in Fountain Grove. On hot and windy days when the ground is dry and plants have little moisture in stems and leaves, fire can race through almost any landscape threatening homes and lives. If there's any defense, defense against fire in the landscaping, it is more likely through firewise landscape design and maintenance rather than plant selection. There are some factors that are generally accepted that will make a plant more likely to burn and carry fire. Some of these are low moisture content, high surface area to volume ratio, high oil content, and the genetic tendency to accumulate dead leaves and stems within the plant, and the duff or partly de decayed organic matter on the ground. So many of these factors can be mitigated by careful siting, regular maintenance, and appropriate irrigation. So proper maintenance is truly the key to fire resistant. It's not about plant, just plant selection. And it's particularly important to keep dead leaves and branches from accumulating in the center of a plant, which will make it more flammable. So where shouldn't you plant? So we're gonna spend more time shortly on the zero to five foot house. Sign to embers from igniting your home when they land in organic matter. Other places that are especially vulnerable to fire include under vents and eaves, in front of windows and combustible siding, under or near decks. Sorry, hold on. And inside corners of your home. So these are all places where embers can introduce fire directly to your home. Okay, ladder fuels. Hopefully you're all familiar with the concept of ladder fuels. 
The goal is to reduce the possibility of having fire move from the ground plane into the trees. Avoid planting shrubs under trees, but if you do, allow at least three times the height of a shrub between it and the lowest tree limb. Limb up all trees at least six feet from the ground or one third the height of the tree, and then it's critical to maintain it as it grows. Okay. All right, plant spacing. Um, uh, over the last eight months that we've been working together as a team, we have spent countless hours discussing appropriate plant spacing. There is no scientific research that substantially supports ideal spacing lines, guidelines within 100 feet of buildings. These are CAL FIRE's recommendations for plant spacing guidelines within that 100 foot zone around your home. These are not mandated by, line, by law. I wanna just reinforce that these are guidelines and best knowledge recommendations. So these guidelines for horizontal and vertical spacing are due to flame height. And the slope of the land around the home is a major consideration in assessing wildfire risk. A fire will burn faster and more intensely uphill than along flat ground and a steeper slope will result in a faster moving fire with longer flame lengths. Spacing between grass, shrubs, and trees is crucial to reduce the spread of wildfires, and the spacing needed is greater based on the slope of the land. So on flat to gently sloping terrain, individual shrubs or small clumps of shrubs should be separated from one another by at least twice the height of the tallest shrub in that group. For homes located on steeper slopes, the separation distance should be greater. So for example, if the typical shrub height in a plant grouping is two feet and you're in a less than 20% slope, you want to have a separation between the shrub plantings of at least four feet, which you can achieve by either removing existing shrubs or pruning shrubs to reduce their height and or diameter spacing. And we wanna share that low growing, well irrigated grasses, ground covers or perennials are considered to be acceptable between these plant groupings. But each of us needs to assess the overall risk with the degree of slope and fire risk to make appropriate decisions in our home landscapes. This graphic uh, is depicting suggested horizontal tree spacing as well as vertical space separation, that ladder fuels concept that we discussed earlier. Note again, the three times the height of the shrub, <coughs> excuse me, from the top of the shrub to the lowest tree branches. Spacing on less than a 20% slope of 10 feet is recommended. And on steeper slopes, the recommended distance, of course, is increased. So as Ellie referenced, we don't have to denude our landscapes in the 100 foot perimeter around the home. But we do wanna ensure that we have spacing to reduce the fuel volume and help break up the spread of fire to your home. Okay, the previous slide showed CAL FIRE recommendations on tree and shrub spacing. This is a recommendation from the NFPA or the National Fire Protection Association. And there are good arguments to justify both perspectives. Sorry, my feline roommate is trying to intrude on the presentation. Um, this graphic provides uh, another perspective on tree spacing based on the distance from your home. And these are all best recommendations to support improving your home's fire safety. And you need to consider your own property's specific aspects to make appropriate decisions to increase your safety. Okay, uh, let's move into the dis a discussion of the defensible space zones around your house. So we're gonna start uh, at the first zone after you've hardened your home is the zero to five foot zone. Okay. The zero to five foot zone is called the Ember Defense Zone. And uh, the objective of this zone, uh, which is supported by scientific research, which I mentioned earlier, is to reduce the chance of windblown embers from a fire landing near the home and igniting combustible debris or materials, thus exposing the home to flames. This zone is closest to the house, so it requires the most careful selection and management of vegetation and other possible fuels. Classically, we have massed shrubs against the house, which we call foundation shrubs. So this is a big shift from traditionally how we have designed our landscapes. 
And when I talk to, you know, landscape designers about this concept, a lot of them really struggle with it. Um, but we really need to think about, shift our thinking and rethink our lens on our design and our landscapes. Um, and think about the fuel this generates for fire in immediate proximity to our house. This is a relatively newer zone introduced uh, into the defensible space recommendations. And this is supported by research conducted by Stephen, Dr. Stephen Quarles after he left the University of California and moved to doing research with the Insurance Institute of Business, Home and Safety. And there are some great videos online um, showing them doing testing in the lab, showing the risk to the home resulting from embers. So I cannot um, stress enough, this is a scientifically supported recommendation. But it's perhaps one that folks will struggle with the most because it's really counter to what we have done historically in our landscapes. And in that same vein, we need to disconnect the fuel of a wood fence uh, or gate that connects to our home. Use a metal gate uh, if it's connected to the house. Uh, so suggested options uh, in this zero to five foot perimeter can be a non-flammable lunch mulch such as gravel or stone. Uh, and we want to, there's you know, simple things we can do to re remove, for example, natural fiber doormats that would ignite if embers landed in them. Okay, during a wildfire, thousands of embers can rain down on roofs and pelt the side of homes like hail during a storm. If these embers become lodged in something easily ignited on or near the house, the home will be in jeopardy of burning. We are not saying that all existing trees must be removed, but you should consider placement and especially regular maintenance of those trees. And if a tree is close to the house, ensure you are regularly cleaning the roof of debris during fire season. Roof litter maintenance is critical. The leaves pile up in the same places every year and that the, the biggest problem here would be exposure to the vulnerable walls, not the possibly class A roofing material. Embers coming into contact with flammable material is the major reason why homes are destroyed during the wildfire season. And our code elements here, again, this is uh, one you're seeing repeated throughout the presentation to remove any dead branches and limb up any existing tree limbs. And code mandates cutting tree limbs 10 feet from stovepipe or chimney outlets, and that is year round. Okay, let's talk about maintenance in the Ember Defense Zone. Here are some maintenance recommendations for this zone. This should be done regularly on a regular basis through the fire season. So we wanna clean up and dispose of leaves, pine needles, or other plant litter from this zone, remove debris from roof and gutters, and climbing vines must be free of dead or dying material. In, well, it's actually in the zero to 30 foot zone is the code requirement, but we're applying this of course uh, to the zero to five foot zone as well or you wanna remove them from any trees or structures. And I will say there are some code complexities um, uh, based on whether your property is in an SRA, a state responsibility area, or an LRA, a local responsibility area, um, uh, based on what the recommendations are here. But in general, uh, I would recommend that you wanna follow this practice. Okay, let's move into the next zone, which is the home defense zone, five to 30 feet from the house. And this is also um, typically called the lean, clean, and green zone. So your home defense zone, you also wanna think about access for firefighters because this is likely where they're making a stand to defend your home. All right, in zone one, we suggest that you plant in islands separated by hardscape, right? So you have distinct plant groupings separated by hardscape material. Optimally, you should select low ground cover, such as mown native grass, herbaceous perennials, and succulents. And this is an excellent zone for hardscapes, such as a pool, brick patio, paving stones, dry creek bed, or boulder. So the goal is to reduce the connectivity between your garden beds, shrubs, and trees. So if wildfire does come into this zone, the wildfire will not be able to burn to the house or into the crowns of the trees. We also want to Keep, keep in mind that this is our zone that creates a place for fire personnel to be located to defend your home and property. So you can have shrubs, uh, trees, and small shrubs or tree groupings. They can be used if they're pruned, properly irrigated, and horizontally separated from 
from other plant groupings. But optimally, you might want to consider a specimen or individual shrub or individual trees in this zone. You want to water the plants to maintain their health throughout the year and regularly maintain them to remove dead or dry material. Um, you also, can, we also want to keep in mind that you need to avoid ladder fuels, right? That's, that's true throughout your entire property. Uh, remove dead material and lower tree branches, limb trees up to six feet, right? All these same themes you've been hearing me talk about. Um, and it is a code requirement to move wood piles to 30 feet from buildings and cover the, or cover them with a fire resistant tarp and then clear surrounding vegetation around that wood pile. Okay, let's move into zone two, the reduced fuel zone. And the objective of the reduced fuel zone is to create and maintain a landscape that if ignited will not readily, readily transmit fire to your home. All right, in this zone, we have the same basic principles as zone one, but you can include some larger shrubs and trees in widely spaced groups. You wanna continue the focus on creating islands of vegetation that are separated by hardscape, and you wanna ensure that you have access, uh, easy access for maintenance and continue your vigilance on ladder fuel removal. Okay. Four to five foot wide walkways can help separate planting areas and simplify maintenance. Optimally, you want to choose gravel, brick, decomposed granite, right, an inorganic uh, material or possibly an irrigated native mold grass strip, but wood mulch is okay in this zone. You want to keep your annual grasses mown to a maximum height of two to four inches. And as Ellie mentioned earlier, we want to make sure we're removing any invasive plants that can spread to neighboring properties. <clears throat> okay, once you've done the work to harden your home and prepare your defensible space, it's important to reach out and work with your neighbors. Uh, if you're like me, my zero to 100 foot of defensible space does extend into my neighbor's property. So I need to be working with them to make sure that I'm ready. So neighborhood considerations um, include possibly working together to develop a fuel reduction plan, uh, watching for maintenance needed, and considering total volume of vegetation in the area. Other neighborhood considerations, look at the space between the homes to minimize risk. Support biodiversity by creating habitat corridors in between your homes. And there are many coping groups that have started up around the county to work as a team in fire preparedness in individual neighborhoods. It's critically important to ensure that your, you, your family, and firefighters have clear access in and out of your property. So we want to maintain vegetation on both sides of roads and driveways, 10 feet from the road edge and 15 feet vertically. And you want to maintain 12 feet of unobstructed pavement for passage of vehicles. So what would we do to make this driveway more firewise? We would cut the grass right down to two to four inches and limb up the trees. We follow the same vegetation management principles we talked about in zone two. And if you reside in a more densely forested area, you can control um, fire behavior by reducing ladder fuels, opening up the canopy of the trees and maintaining uh, ground fuels. And this will help uh, firefighters with fire suppression during a fire. Okay, mulch. A lot of folks are con concerned about using mulch since it's organic and it's flammable in their home landscapes. This is one of those tensions that exists between sustainable landscaping principles and firewise principles. But organic mulch does serve an important purpose it conserves uh, moisture and can help with weed reduction. So compost and large sized composted mulch, arbor mulch are the best options. And this is based on a scientific research study on the flammability of mulches conducted by the University of Nevada at Reno and the University of California. So we wanna separate areas mulched with these materials, these woody combustible materials, with um, ignition resistant materials where we can, such as concrete, gravel, rock, and a native grass lawn, as I mentioned earlier. It's important to use no gorilla hair. This is depicted in the upper picture here, and uh, it's directly adjacent to um, what looks like relatively unmaintained hedges of juniper. So that's, you know, just inviting a fire to come right up 
into integrating that home. Um, extremely susceptible to ignition from embers. And as I mentioned before, in the zero to five foot zone, ember defense zone, no organic mulch within that, within that space around your house. Festival materials where possible. Okay, much of your success depends on maintenance in your defensible space zone. Throughout the year, you need to continuously monitor for this needed maintenance. And we've talked repeatedly about removing dead plants and dead branches from trees and shrubs, and also about removing vines from trees and shrubs. Here are recommendations that you should do annually before any fire season, right? You wanna do pruning and vegetation thinning in the fall and early winter, as Ellie referenced, to avoid harm to bird breeding. And you don't wanna cut um, grass to bear dirt, right? You can uh, leave it to two to four inches tall or less. Um, and it's important to keep viable vegetation in place for erosion control, especially on slopes. Be particularly sensitive to dry leaf litter uh, at the beginning of the fire season. Uh, and frankly, um, given some of the messaging that I've been hearing lately, uh, we should probably be starting to pay attention to this this year as early um, as uh, is June. So we want to uh, cut back woody perennials and shrubs, thin overgrown vegetation, consider the timing of our plant removals and cutbacks, and reuse site materials uh, where possible, uh, reuse on-site materials uh, when possible. Uh, you keep, keep any chipped wood on your site or compost it as mulch. Uh, and move wood piles again from 30 feet from your buildings. I, there's another great video also from the firefighters when they were uh, trying to hold the fire back from Windsor of firefighters who'd thrown a bunch of firewood into the middle of a lawn. Uh, obviously it had been left up against next to the house. Um, so don't make the firefighters have to do that extra work when they're trying to fight the fire to defend your home and defend your town. So every few years as needed, uh, it's suggested to thin and reduce tree canopies to remove twiggy growth and maintain separation between trees and reduce overall fuel load. Uh, again, uh, repeated this many, many times, you wanna keep the lowest branches of trees pruned up at least six, six feet from the ground. We're not doing it just once, we're monitoring that on an ongoing basis. Cut back ground covers and vines to remove a buildup of dry stems and dead leaves and cut back shrubs to renew. This is a great graphic from East Bay Mud that shows uh, before the maintenance has been done. Uh, we've got ladder fuels, we have no break in the planted areas, and we have shrubs massed up against the house. And after maintenance, we now see we have islands of vegetation, right? The shrubs next to the house have been removed. The trees been limbed up and ladder fuels removed and shrubs and trees have been thinned. This is another great East Bay mud graphic that's a great illustration of recommended tree maintenance, which is also key to fire resistance, right? We need to be uh, looking at our properties with a lens to fuel load. Uh, it shows how uh, you can thin the canopy. Of course, we're mowing the grasses and weeds below the tree. And again, uh, trimming up a minimum of six feet up from the surface. Okay, we did a quick fly through that and um, we will have the presentation available later. I know I went really fast this morning. We had a lot of material to cover and I wanna give April plenty of time to talk about what I know you're all gonna wanna hear about, which is I'm um, seeing this translated into some, some actual design concepts and some plant recommendations for your home landscape. But I hope I've given you a basic framework for evaluating the landscape in the zero to 100 foot defensible space zone around your home. Um, a firewise and sustainable landscape is possible that incorporates beauty, safety, and privacy, saves water, and supports wildlife, but plant placement and design are key, maintenance is essential, and you need to start at the house and work out and implement a zero to five, non, zero to five foot non-combustible zone around your house perimeter. So there are some great publications. I referenced these earlier on home landscaping for fire, home hardening, and here's that mulch combustibility study that I referenced earlier. Uh, here's our Master Gardener, UC Master Gardener program of Sonoma County website for links to these publications and more resources. And that is it. Mimi, we have a couple of questions. Okay. Um, first of all, you didn't need to worry about speed because the 
it was slowing down. So at some point you were slowing down. Oh, well, maybe that's what I need is slow network to help slow me down. <laughs> so, okay. So, um, hold on a second because the questions keep disappearing. One of the questions was about tree height and particularly about fruit trees. You know how people like to keep their fruit trees shorter so that they can reach them. Um, how do you deal with that? It depends how close the trees are to the house, you would say? I'd probably consider which defensible space zone you're in. Uh, you might want to treat it as a large shrub in that context. I would still consider limbing it up from the bottom, right? So the fire is not transmitting directly up if it's coming along the ground into the tree and then transmitting at a higher level. Uh, so I, it's just a, a new context of, of thinking about it from a, and you'll look at shrubs and trees differently now, I hope, and you look at them and think about how a fire might transmit up into that uh, tree or shrub. Uh, a lot of people were asking about the links. The links are in the chat and we will have them also available later for people. Um, the other question was uh, about the wind. Uh, somebody was saying that the north wind is what burned their home in 2017. Sheltered areas on the south side of the house were less critical. Is there mm. anything about the wind and the placement of your home? Mm. So that's actually really beyond the scope of my expertise. Um, I, I would invite, I, I believe Linda Collister, who's, um, who's with the Healdsburg Department, Fire Department is on the line. Linda, would you have any thoughts or perspectives you might share in that regard? Hi, Mimi. I'm on my treadmill, so I, I apologize. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> multitasking. Yeah, the exact question was about the... The wind. Um, the side of the, you know, where the wind... Oh, on the south side, yeah. I yeah. read his... Um, yeah, it, it definitely depends on which way the wind is coming and the slope, because the fire will preheat in front of the... Um, will preheat any vegetation or fuels in front of the fire. So if there's a slope going up to their house, which most people have it, um, yeah, you want to be careful about that. So you might even create more defensible space, as well as... I'm looking what kind of fuels there is on that side. South aspecting slope seems to tend to heat up more in the summertime, so just be aware of that. Thank you. Um, Thanks, another Linda. question was about, uh, you know, and this is a problem that we've talked about is we're talking about defensible space, but some people live in denser areas. Somebody was asking that their home is 15 feet away from the neighbor and the neighbor has a wooden fence and they live in an HOA, you know. So yeah, so I mean, it's 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 going to be challenging, y'all. I mean, not all of us have great relationships with our neighbors. Um, for sure, in that kind of a scenario, you're going to want to harden your house and make sure you've got a really strong ember defense zone in your zero to five foot zone. Um, and then, you know, if there's tree limbs coming over that that are concerned to you, to to talk to your neighbor and and work with them on some type of strategy, but. Um, that's why there's a lot of really great neighborhood groups that could be helpful in that regard to help educate all the neighbors and help kind of build up the opportunity for folks to work together on these issues in their neighborhood. I have to say one of the really great side benefits from my perspective on shelter in place due to the pandemic has been all my stay at home neighbors have been doing um, massive vegetation management work. So we're better prepared for fire season than we ever have been. I live northeast of Cloverdale in a high fire severity zone. So um, it's, it can be challenging, but, but it really is about, uh, in that kind of scenario, working with your neighbors. And since in this situation, there's an, a, a homeowners association involved, you could probably get the homeowners association engaged. That's a great idea. And at a minimum, you're going to want to make sure you don't have any wooden gates connecting to your home. Um, I would be more concerned about that, um, transferring the fire from the fence to your home. Um, then the other question is about uh, the scotch broom and the invasiveness and what leverage and strategies are available to encourage management before broom is everywhere. Are there yeah. regulations or codes to help? Um, I would have to look to Linda again if there's any regulations on scotch broom. I'm not familiar with that. She'd have some better perspective. Um, but certainly that same neighborhood group type of development that could perhaps work on broom removal. Uh, is a great initiative. I know um, there used to be a great group called Fire Free Fitch that did a lot of broom removal work 
uh, by bringing neighbors together to do work days. So that's a great opportunity for bringing neighbors together to work on that vegetation management. Just, okay. um, if, I could, if I could mention something about that. Um, yeah. I saw in the chat question something about cutting the broom when it was in flower. And I do want to discourage people from cutting broom. Um, the, really the only way to get rid of it is to pull it up by its roots. It has a very, for a, like a four or five, six foot tall broom, the root system can be only like, you know, five or five inches to a foot. And they're different. There are all kinds of different um, techniques for pulling broom. But if you cut it, it's actually going to cause the roots to go down deep. And it's going to be really, really hard to pull later on. Um, uh, Ellie, I could link to the UCIPM um, a pest note on how to deal with scotch broom. I could Yeah, that, that's a great idea. And then Ellie talked in her talk about the fact that um, a single plant can can develop thousands of seeds in one season. And there's uh, a huge seed bank associated with that over years. So it's an ongoing maintenance issue. You can't think you're gonna go through and pull that broom once. It will disturb the seed bank and sprout some more broom. So that's an ongoing maintenance issue that has to be dealt with. Um, another question was about the responsibility that land trusts and for example, parks have if they abut to your property on uh, the defensible space, but I'm pretty sure it's the same rules as applied to homeowners. Those are in yeah, terms great. of- I, I don't have any knowledge on that, uh, unfortunately. Um, Ellie, I could, I could mention something about that because we have open be space. We have open space that backs up to a lot of properties within Fitch Mountain. Thanks, and Linda. along the residents, yeah. So we have a vegetation management plan that we're required to follow as well as what we can do, but we always try to get in there. I write a fire risk abatement plan every year. And what we try to do is create a defensible space. Um, but what's hard about it is it's usually on uh, slopey areas or hard to get to. And we're really limited about what kind of treatments we're allowed to do. We can't use pesticides, we can't use mechanical. Uh, we're looking right now at trying to get in a grant for goats and letting them loose. Um, but, you know, like I said, all that's costs a lot of money too. Um, the next question is on duff under redwoods in the zero to 30 zone. How much duff is too much duff? Well, so I would say in zero to five, you want to be cleaning that duff out year round, right? Keep it out of the ember defense zone. Uh, it is an important sustainability aspect for the trees, um, right? That decomposing duff uh, returns nutrients to the to the redwoods. I'd say you want to make sure you don't have any ladder fuels that you've limbed them up substantially, um, uh, and that you're not you don't have any other factors that would contribute to fire transmitting up into the crown of those trees. Um, okay, uh, what is your opinion on the proliferation of coffee berry and very fine and feathery cyanosis post fire? That's actually you. Uh, uh, coffee berry is a fabulous native shrub. <laughs> One of my favorites, as is cyanothus. I'm, I'm not aware of the proliferation of those post fire in some burn areas. Um, I would certainly want to support native plants returning uh, for the habitat value that they provide. Um, but maybe just kind of watch the different, uh, especially if it's in the zero to 100 foot zone around your house, watch the different kind of principles that I shared in the presentation. Um, sorry about this. Uh, then uh, uh, can you more specific flame resistant fence materials providing visual privacy? Mm, I would, I would Google that. There's lots yeah. of uh, resources that would be online. I don't have any specific ones to share with folks. And I think we're going to have to, we're at 1124. I think we need to be sensitive to giving April enough time for her presentation. Um, happy to um, take any other questions and we can try to um, capture those and share some, uh, share some of those responses perhaps in, in an email post event. Uh, but I'm, I'm concerned about making sure that we give April enough time for her presentation. And we'll have more time for questions after mine. If, if anybody great. wants to stand up for a minute, I'm, we're just going to switch over to my screen. So it might take a moment here. So, all right. Thanks, everybody. And, and um, you're in excellent hands with, with April Owens, uh, who's um, a practicing landscape designer and uh, is has started up the a nonprofit Habitat Quarter project advocating for the use of native plants. So you're in great hands with plant design and uh, selection recommendations. So 
show you can see my notes. I'm going to try to get my notes up for just a sec, but it won't let me. Okay, I'm just going to wing it. <laughs> to the beginning. All right, so I am April Owens, and Ellie and, Ellie and Mimi, those were amazing, full of content um, presentations. Like they, they both said, we have been working on these, this partnerships and and getting to the bottom of all all the fire and resilient landscape issues and working with such great great people and it's all most of it's volunteer time so we want to thank you know all the groups that have been involved um like Mimi said I'm a landscape designer I've been working with native plants for about 20 years now please let me know if you can't hear me well because I can't see the chat too um uh and I started the Habitat Corridor Project about five years ago, feeling like just landscape design wasn't enough and I wanted to give back to the community um, and help people use native plants more. And so a percentage of all of our profits from my private landscape design company go into the Habitat Corridor Project to run its programs, as well as um, the Habitat Corridor Project since the fires has been um, taking on design clients that want help creating a fire resistant landscape, whether it be a, a, a consultation or um, hold plans to help you rebuild um, with all these principles involved. And we've learned a lot over the last couple of years. So I wanna show you some of the, the examples of the plants and also some options from the, for the different zones. So I'm gonna follow Mimi's recommendations and just give you some more photos and examples. Um, and we'll have a good chunk of time. I'll make sure to, to leave about 15 minutes at the end so we can answer your questions about native plants. So I'm just gonna move people out of the way here. Okay, so resilient landscapes as, we, as, as both of my, the, me and Ellie have talked about, um, are really about more than just fire. So I found after the fires, we really all focused a lot on fire and I understand that, but we also need to remember that we are in a drought cycle in California that we have development happening in California where so we're having this huge biodiversity loss so it's really important to to um to think about that in this, this system too so we really want to take it from a broader perspective and look at it from a systemic point of view um and so what we always recommend is that you start where you live so Sonoma County has this unique sense of place that Ellie went through all these a lot of the um plant communities to consider. Um, and then we, since this group isn't just for the Glen Ellen Forum, since it's a broader um, focus of Sonoma County right now, I just wanted to point out some of the, the plant communities that we tend to use in our designs for residential landscapes. So like Oak Woodland and Savannah are kind of a mix, like the Savannah part is like a grassland that comes in contact with the oak. So there's this, this um, blend there. The mixed evergreen forest and redwood forest, um, those are, you know, can be really challenging plant communities in a lot of ways because of dealing with fire. So we'll talk about that a little bit more about um, how to deal with these, these um, uh, trees. That, you know, if you if you find your home in the middle of a redwood forest, it makes it really hard to follow these zero to five, you know, these different zones. Um, chaparral is like a, a drier zone. So a lot of times when we're doing lawn replacement, I'll use you know, some manzanita and ground covers, um, coyote brush um, out of that plant community, and then grasslands and riparian. Um, so the kind of the oak woodland mixed evergreen forest plant community, redwood and riparian are kind of the shady plants. And then um, the, um, the more sun loving plants fall into the chaparral and grasslands and savanna. Leo, can you hear me okay? Is everything sounding good? Ellie? Yes, yes we can hear you fine. It's okay. just, it, it's the, I think the bandwidth was a little bit slow. It would do. Okay, so that's. Okay, that's so it was, it was, I just didn't, so let me know if it's becoming a recurring problem so we can figure okay. it out. Okay. All right, so. So sustainability, being a designer and practicing landscape architecture and going to design school, um, 
when we approach a landscape and even a homeowner can really start at you know just backing up from your landscape and thinking about where your plant community is where there's opportunities on your site to sink water in maybe there's an area that could be a small swale or rain garden so it's really taking a moment to back up look at some of the resources online that we've offered in the in the notes um, our Habitat Corridor Project website has a lot of free plans that you can download. And so make sure to, to visit, you know, visit these sites, see what's out there for free plans, what good combinations can happen. Um, so I always recommend, you know, doing a little sketch, you know, get, a, get your measuring tape out, measure your site. Um, and then Ellie covered this brilliantly, but, you know, why use California native plants, the food web? They're resilient. They're adapted to California. They are easy. They're more easily hydrated. So the whole key to this this firewise landscaping is to have well hydrated plants, well maintained plants. And California natives are much easier hydrated, and they're adapted to our system of these these long summer, you know, these dry summers, which we've been loving this little extra rain this year. But um, so usually this is when I open up for some some people talking about using natives, but maybe in the chat, you guys could write if you use natives, if you have, you know, specific questions um, uh, about habitat or, or anything. But these are just some some of my friends and people in the Native Plant Society that wrote about, you know, what the, some of the different aspects of using natives that, that and what one of my favorite things is this whole in insect and animal populations thriving. So you have a beautiful garden, but then on top of that, there's this new layer of beautiful butterflies and bumblebees and birds um, coming in. Um, recently, I have a crow and a, and a, a, a Stellar's Jay that are like trying to fight it out for our neighborhood habitat. So being home, it's been kind of fun to see um, what's going on in our neighborhood. Um, I don't know why that check went in there. Um, so zero to five zone. So we're just going to look at a few photos to give you some exact ideas. Because like Mimi said, it is, it is tough the um, the um, this zone because we've been trained to do foundation shrubs. That's like what you do. You go, you know, uh, builders create ugly foundations and then we cover them with pretty shrubs. Well, now that's not feasible in California. So we need to think about other options and other things we can use in those in those spaces. We use a lot of boulders and decorative rock. Um, this is a crushed Trinity rock that I use a lot. Um, this is a cut boulder. You can make it kind of like a sculpture. Um, we, we sometimes have these boulders cut into like a, a pan for, for birds and butterflies to use. You know, you can just passively fill them with water and they're never deep enough for mosquitoes or anything. Um, this is an area you can use containers with maybe your annuals or your plants that need a little bit more water. Um, I use a lot uh, this Nomo Fescue product from, I only know that it's a product from Del Delta Bluegrass, but I imagine there's other turf companies coming out with these native mixes of turf that are softer than the lawn. They use less water. This picture was just right when we installed it. And so the steel header, which is another um, thing I use a lot in the landscape, was just too warm for the, the grass, but it, it ended up um, being green right to the edge. Um, this is fun because it's a play meadow for kids, but up against your foundation, you can use this combination. Um, and uh, so just to have some contrast, sometimes I'll do this like in the front or around your patio in, in that zero to five, or even, you know, uh, even more in the five to 30 zone. Um, this is another ground cover. Gosh, this, I'm sorry about that. Let me try to get rid of that. I guess I can't. I don't know why that checks there. Um, if anybody knows that, just type in, please. I had to get rid of this check. Um, but let's see. So this is from a designer at um, Native Valley Designs, a friend of mine, and she is another really great resource that's going to be offering free consultations for fire rebuild. She's in Napa. So this is a Napa rebuild. But this ground cover called Lipia um, or Carapia, sometimes they, they call it. The Carapia is, I don't, it's, I don't know that it's really um, California native. It's a, it's a it's a version of the native lipia that is um, that is uh, made uh, so the seed is is non viable to the so it doesn't spread into wild spaces. 
um, but she used some interesting kind of modern aesthetic, you know, going out from the house with hardscape. Another hardscape option would be um, using um, using large flagstone at the base of the house. And this is a ground cover called Daimondia that's not native, but it grows really flat. So just to show you that you can get a little bit of plant material in here, you just need to make sure that it's well hydrated and very low and well maintained. Another kind of a medley of photos, I think this is Mimi's sister's um, house here in the left corner. Um, this is a rebuild up at Mark West, and this is an occidental landscape. All, all four of these um, are ways like thinking about parking courts and some different fun ways to, you know, create that that zero to five with rock. Um, think about where how you use your site, where your parking is going to go, um, and, and kind of inc incorporate that into your firewise landscaping. Um, in design zero to five, this is a, you know, think about like a lot of us live in oak woodlands and in redwood forest. So right under the at this arrow is a house that survived the Kincaid fire. And you can see where the fire came really close to the, to the um, vineyard there. He had maintained, they had gone in right before we'd actually consulted with them about two months before the Kincaid fire. And they had cleaned up um, a lot of their, you know, weed whacked and made sure everything was really clean, really well hydrated. And they put in um, sprinkler systems um, that I'll talk about later too, so they could hydrate off their well uh, with their generator right before the fire came towards their house the second day of the Kincaid fire. And um, the, the owner, you know, the, um, was able to stay as long as they could and defend the house and the house survived the fire when, when all their neighbors um, didn't make it through, unfortunately. But trees, you know, we have to think about the summer and the, ener the energy savings of a large tree. You just have to be vigilant about um, cleanup and maintenance in the in the fire season, which like Mimi said, this summer, you know, it's gonna be earlier. So um, finding that balance between, you know, these beautiful old trees and their leaf litter, which I know native oaks, the live oaks do have a, a lot of um, leaf fall. Um, and I always go by the two inches or less kind of um, idea with with mulch nowadays there is some controversy with like the city of santa rosa requiring three inches or more in firefighters and the, the science is showing you know more than two inches or less is more important so like like mimi was saying you have to you know you have to mitigate your own risks on where you live um in in the, in the, the fire ecology um here's a five to thirty um i wanted to show this slide because you know, swales and mounds, and there's all kinds of beautiful options. You want to make sure, like under this swale, it's so close to the house, we have a French drain, so it doesn't actually seep the soil. The, we don't want water within 10 feet of the house sinking in under your house. We went back in after this was put in uh, before the, the Kincaid fire, um, and I hadn't been really aligned with the, you know, now that we're such resilient designers. Um, so we went back and added, um, if I can get my little pointer. We added this pebble up here and we took out the mulch from the house. And then since then we've taken out these larger spice bushes and moved them down the slope to another area that's safer so that we only have this really easily hydratable monkey flower. And this is a very wet site um, in Occidental. So these plants can you know, get a lot more water even in the summer from fog and then juncus. So we, um, in that five foot zone, we kind of incorporated some plants that we felt are safer. Um, and would be acceptable. Um, and I, again, thinking about watering systems for your landscape and what you're gonna do in the fire season now, we've been putting in more overhead sprinklers um, so that people can easily hydrate on those hot days, those, those red flag days, and I'll talk about that more. So paths of separation of islands, start moving a little faster here. Um, so we use a lot, a lot of times you can use flagstone, you can use, um, you know, to separate these, these masses of plant. We have a four foot wide path going through this whole garden and then lower, you know, mounds of, of plants that we cut back like that tall plant in the back um, would be cut back right here. Um, that's a, a non-native, but a really high value um, habitat plant called Lepicinia hasada. And that can be cut back to the ground every other year. And so it has all this fleshy, growth that is less, less um, fire risk. Masses of low growing plants like California fuchsia, 
um, this is where I was going to talk a little bit about um, cultivars, and we'll talk about that more. But when we talk about these plants like California fuchsia, there are so many different cultivars and selections from different areas. Some of them grow small and low. Some of them will get really big and woody. So you really have to think about, um, look up your plants and know what that, the, how that cultivar is going to work. Um, California fuchsia, like Calistoga, and this is Wayne Silver, stay really low and are, are really wonderful because they bloom in, in August and September when things are kind of low in the garden. This is a good picture because in the background, like this could be a transition zone. This actually is a waterfall kind of behind that going down, but you can see where you have like lower plants and then some taller plants. So you can use some of these natives is really low growing in the in the in-between space between your, your habitat islands. Rain gardens, um, of course, 10 feet out from the house. This is a wonderful way to see our rains in the winter closer up. I really enjoy, you know, since we don't get rain that often, to, to actually you know, have it in the garden um, so you can, you can get your frogs going and, and, um, and see, see the season happening. So in the 30 to 100, we're moving out. Um, so now we're going from the, the five to 30, which is pretty much only low things with some couple of shrubs in there, if, as long as they're well-maintained, to moving to like islands. Now you can have a little bit more, the masses of the islands can be a little larger. The spaces in between them should be larger, but this is where you can get a lot more habitat with your, with your native shrubs like Toyon, um, using steer grass that, you know, as long as you cut it back every couple of years, so get, you know, making these islands, we're still trying to decide what a safe island size is. Um, back to Mimi's um, and Ellie's um, diagram with the, the heights versus the, so if you have a six foot shrub, you, you know, you're gonna have a 12 foot distance between the island, but you can make that a pretty big island if you can do that shrub kind of in the middle of the island and then do some lower plants, habitat plants going out from there. We were talking yesterday in a meeting about what to use in between. Um, and so uh, I was just wanted to show you a few options if, that you could use in these, these mode or these spaces in between the islands, like arbor mulch, as Mimi showed, um, which is composted um, tree bark from, and then there's the, the, the mowed California bunch grasses or well-maintained ground cover. These bunch grasses, are, their roots are, are three times bigger than the top of the plant that you see. So they're key in securing slopes, like if you're working in a slope of clearing, um, and so they can be hacked back every year. And a lot of them grow slower. So if you don't want to be out there weed whacking every couple of years, you can find a cultivar or a species that grows low, like the Nomo fescue is Vesuca rubra, which is a, just a low growing meadow grass. And at the bottom here is the coyote brush. Um, again, with the cultivars, there's a coyote brush that you see commonly that gets really big and it needs to be maintained a lot. Um, it does have a, a huge habitat value for quail and all the pollinators. So if you can incorporate some, some larger coyote brush in your garden, um, it can be cut back every couple of years, um, even just a few. But you can also use the lower growing twin peaks for, um, for pigeon point coyote brush, and they both grow um, very low and, and it takes them a long time to get woody. I'm gonna run you through a couple of before and afters to try to plug this, um, this idea of losing your lawn, which we, a lot of us are, are on board with this. I started my career 20 years ago and we were just trying, trying to start getting people to lose their lawns. And now I feel like the aesthetic of, of, of a perennial garden has really you know, become much more accepted. Um, this is the, that was before, this is the middle. So this was a landscape in Healdsburg, with the one that we sh showed earlier with the pathways. So we were laying out like the large pathways in this landscape, we used um, road base and, and made the pathway kind of come up higher because there was a water issue on site. So again, thinking about um, the water on your site and how, how best, you know, you're best gonna be treating your specific site. And this is the after, um, buckwheats and monkey flowers. And in that swale, we had um, a ton of buckwheat iris, um, uh, I, you know, some of the native iris, the hookera in the back there, just champsia, sesotosa is that big grass in the back. And of course you'd want to, you know, keep maintaining this. This was a little crazy. It needs, needs a little bit of taming. I'm going to show you this little video. It's kind of silly, but um, we've been really switching over, especially in the WUI, the Wild Limb Urban Interface landscapes, where we are using these hunter pop-ups that, that use about the same amount of water as 
um, traditional drip, but they, so they're pop-ups with low water use. They, these little fingers of water go around and, and you can um, place it around your shrubs and even put them on risers. So then you can soak the, the plants more in tune with what they want in the summer, which is just a nice over spray, a rain shower, or you can hand water. But I find that natives are really challenged with drip and we're really looking at you know, how the, these systems are costing the same amount as drip going in for an installation. And they really are, they hydrate the soil, they hydrate the plants the way that they want. Um, we talked a lot about invasive plants. Here's a before and after. If you're in the rainy season and getting after that broom when it's just two years old, um, the first year it's really hard to pull. The second year it's a lot easier to pull. And so we, this was an afternoon of work um, with my mom and I at a site we manage in San Rafael. Um, so some tips for successful habitat planting, um, planning and planting, um, many types of flowers, large group with groupings, you know, consider them pollinator targets. So you want masses of plants, um, flowering at different times and pl plants that provide both nectar and pollen sources. We will have these slides available, but this is a combo that I just adore. And so we, you can come back to this later, um, monkey flower with the the salvias, like Mimi said, you can cut them back to the ground every couple of years, but they just come back blooming like much more beautiful than lavender, I think. And manzanita, you know, used sparingly throughout the landscape, but it's an incredible habitat shrub, slow growing and beautiful. So the sages, um, this is a, a genus of plants um, that I use a ton to, to provide all that habitat and all that flowering. Um, they're very variable. Um, Sonoma sage is a low-growing sage that doesn't ever get more than about six inches tall, so it's a wonderful um, plant to use in your in your landscape. Um, big habitat uh, value again with the cultivar versus species. I think so. so a lot of times that's just such a confusion. Um, you know that that all the there's so many different buckwheats. Say like this is a pink flowering buckwheat, and it's just a little guy that's totally appropriate in the 32 to a hundred the the five to 30, but it, but it has friends in its family or family members that get to be five feet tall. So you just really need to know your cultivars and your plants. And there's a lot of wonderful resources that we're gonna be giving you. Um, you know, there's, this is the coyote brush, brush ground cover with another wonderful sage, the salvia bees bliss. Um, the native shrubs, Toyon is a it's gigantic habitat value, not such a great picture here with the berries. And this, this plant has come back after the fires, um, like one of those questions about who's been coming back in the coffee berry. But it showed how resilient toyons are and how manageable they can be in your landscape. And they are just a huge habitat value. So you can really maintain this shrub, you can hack at it, and it, it's just really um, resilient to garden tolerance. And that's something you wanna find in your natives is plants that are garden tolerant so they can tolerate the trip trimming so some natives don't want to be cut. They don't want to be cut back. They don't want to be hydrated. And so a lot, some of these cultivars like this Mount San Bruno is, I, is my go-to plant. Um, and it has, it's really adapted to like a smaller um, size. I mean, it, it can get pretty big, but it's really tidy in form. In the shade. So since we're talking about plant communities, um, there, you know, there's a lot of plants that can, are really drought, drought tolerant and can be in the, sh in the shade. So like hummingbird sage, on the left here, spice bush is a wonderful deciduous shrub with that red flower. Um, and then the, the, the um, yerba buena is this green ground cover at the bottom. And then um, Ellie talked about hookera, the alum root or, or the uh, coral bells, I think she called them. Um, so some really nice options for the shade garden. You just, you know, and park shade. Or if you're, you know, even, you know, you are, um, in a really uh, like a west western count west county you can use these plants more in the sun so this is my why um i believe that we need to provide a better environment for our future and this is my son when he was like five and he used to come to sites with me and think this is really cool a long time ago um we really you know planting these gardens the habitat value and the amount of life that you're offering by using these plants is is um is what we need to do for the future and that is my talk. I wanted to quickly show you, we have a Resilient Landscapes Coalition website. 
um, that we've been starting up, it's still in the rough phase, but we'll have all this material in the next week or so um, on online. So it's Son Sonoma Resilient Landscapes.com. And we've started to add in a lot of this information, how to reach us. We're gonna have plant lists on here. So I just want to make sure you all had, had um, access to that, that website. And now I think we'll get to questions, Cleo. Yeah, actually, um, I'm going to start you off oh. with one, April. This is Mimi. Yes. Um, job. Fantastic job. Um, we had you. a question earlier on about someone who has, is building a new house. There's a huge existing oak tree, ten, oak tree 10 feet from the house with branches that reach over the roof, and they wanted some recommendations. Yeah, well, we've been talking a ton about that in our group. Um, I, we've, been, we, we've come to the agreement, I think, and Linda, please, um, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but as long as the, the limbs are limbed up six feet above the roof line, um, you're, you're, you're safe and you, you know, you can, you, and, and then you keep that, all that duff cleaned off in the, in the summertime. Yeah, and I would say, so for sure, if it's, if it's an oak tree that does do a lot of leaf drop, that you want to be keeping the leaves, the leaf matter cleaned up from the zero to five zone. And then we've talked about traditionally under oak trees, you want to do California natives, right, that are low water use because you don't want too much water irrigation being applied to an they oak. They don't like summer water. So you're Yeah, they don't like summer like water. Summer so water. there's lots of great, since that's in that five to 30 foot zone, there's lots of great options for low water use California native plants that you could plant under there. That are perennial um, or you know some ground covers um, that won't create ladder fuels under that oak tree that would create a really beautiful environment around the perimeter of your home and you know I think there was a question earlier that um, and I meant to mention this in my presentation trees uh, in proximity to a house are a really important sustainability consideration because they provide shade and reduce your energy usage in the summer so it is we're, we're doing this delicate dance right, um, between maintaining, number one, habitat trees that are so important. As Ellie mentioned, the oak is one of the most important habitat support species um, for supporting biodiversity. Um, so you wanna be, you know, doing a balance of doing your fire readiness, keeping your roof um, cleaned, especially during fire season, keeping your zero to five foot zone cleaned, um, limbing up the trees so it's six feet up from the ground, and, and keeping any dead or dying branches removed out of it. So it is, it's a, a delicate balance. And then of course, considering um, its exact placement and, and relevance to your home. But many of you will have existing trees. I mean, I'm looking at some stunning mature oak trees uh, within five feet of the exterior of my home. So uh, it's a balance that we all need to be looking to achieve to support our native habitat and make sure that we're fire ready. Yeah, and I'll mention that I actually have a house that's built around an oak tree, and it's an ancient tree. It's about three feet in diameter, and it's dropping leaves all, you know, all through the fire season. So I'm up there mm, almost every week <laughs> taking leaves down. But it's, you know, for me, the oak is, um, was there before I was, and it's beautiful. It actually makes the whole neighborhood. Yeah, and then thank you, Linda, for uh, the also the reminding that incredibly important that if it's within 10 feet of the chimney or a stovepipe, you've got to keep branches trimmed back from that. That's an incredibly important um, firewise practice. And what Ellie said about the cleaning the gutters and the corners where the leaves gather, I mean, that's something that you should be doing during the entire fire season, but particularly when it's red flag days, get on that ladder if you can and do clean out the leaf accumulation. Yep, and Linda, thanks for the reminder that that 10 feet from the chimney or the stovepipe is, is a county code requirement, so that's, that's a must do. Um, actually, as an aside, one of the jobs that you learn about gardening is most of it is actually janitorial and clean up. <laughs> <laughs> Too true. Um, I don't, the, 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 there was a repeated question about coyote bush being fire uh, prone. Uh, but then, uh, April, can you address the whole thing about well maintaining plants and? Yeah, well, so coyote bush is one of the brush is one of those one those plants that's kind of on the, it keeps getting on the dirty dozen because people don't understand how important it is and how easy it is to maintain, and so it's it's actually a, a they call it a, well it comes in after fires. It's a plant that's that's 
that um, feeds the soil yeah. and starts building things up um, after any kind of destruction. Um, so uh, it can get giant and it does need to be maintained. And so, uh, the, you know, it, it, but it isn't, like I was talking about the, the different cultivars as well. There's cultivars that grow flat and low. There's, and then the, the, the big one, I'm looking at one out in my garden now and I, I, you know, I cut it back every four years or so and it just fluffs right back up. And it, for a while I had this design idea that I wanted them to be like little balls. And so I would try to cut the, the coyote brush into like, you know, like a, cause we're always trying to find solutions for people using a native for a non-native. So a lot of people want like that, that, that look around their garden of the tidy little shrubs. So coyote brush is actually one of those plants that can tolerate a ton of trimming. The quail can live their whole life cycle in that plant and, and many birds depend on it for their life cycle. So we don't wanna be t just thinking about it without the systemic thought process around where you're at, what your fire danger is and your neighbors and kind of working on coming up with these habitat, you know, biodiversity areas um, that can be safely within your, your, your lot. Uh, and Linda commented, she said, coyote bush gets a bad reputation in uh, areas that are not maintained, that are wild, when it, you know, by not being maintained, it gets a reputation for being fire prone. Um, there was a question, hold on a second, I lost it. Um, uh, about oak trees, when would be a good time to prune oak trees? Like Ellie was saying, Ellie, you want to speak to that? I, I'm not an expert in pruning. I, I, you definitely would need to speak to an arborist about that. Um, my understanding is that it's the best time to prune is after the main flush of growth. So that would be in the fall. Um, I think that's true of many plants, that the fall is the best time to do the pruning. Because they're kind of slowing down and getting ready for winter. And so they're, put, they're putting their resources into in further, I think, and then they get the, the, wet, the wet winter time to, to recover from that shock. But on arborists, you definitely, especially on a larger oak, you definitely want to always get arborist consultation. Leo, yeah, did, you, did you see this question? Um, any advice about what is more flammable, green shrubs or an old wood fence? Our HOA is considering clearing green plants away from fences. Not sure that makes sense. I missed that question, Ali. Thanks for catching it. Well, so both are flammable, both are organic materials. Um, it's that balance, you know, to be great if the wood fence, if the HOA could replace that with even like a metal mesh fence to reduce its flammability. Um, vilifying the plants is, you know, the, the highest risk is, is not really looking at the total picture. So um, hopefully you can- Especially where the fence hits the house, you know, that's a, a lot yeah. of times we're taking out like five foot chunks and putting in metal fence and that even if somebody can't afford to replace or doesn't want it, you know, to replace a whole fence that used all that wood, you can replace a chunk that comes at least next to your house. Um, mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. away from growing vines and things like that on fences. On yep. Vines are so high maintenance. It's, it's you know, I, I'm always steering, trying to steer people away from them. Um, and I think uh, those were pretty much all the questions, unless other people have any other questions. Um, uh, so I did want to, I shared in the chat box that um, we recorded this. Um, we'll share this on our, our new web page and I'm sure on our own individual websites as well. Um, we will, um, we covered a lot of material <laughs> in a short period of time. Machine gun. Um, so I'm happy to share our PowerPoint presentations. So you've got those as resources to check back into. And um, we, I, if I can speak for all of us, we're so grateful for all of you for your interest. It's amazing, uh, 100, over 100 people. Yeah, just thrilled with the, the turnout. And uh, we'll be doing more of these workshops uh, uh, for the community around Sonoma County and um, hoping we can continue to spread the good word. <laughs> I think everybody's commenting how helpful it was and that it was a terrific presentation and thanking us for the content. Oh, um, uh, yeah, we can also copy the links we shared in a follow-up email um, that were shared in the chat box. Yeah, that's so you don't have to type them all out. <laughs> but you can also copy and paste, you can copy and paste from the chat box, but we're happy to, to share those as well.